Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Blood Smear and Bone Marrow Staining, Manual versus Automated. I am Cassie Soltman of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Elitech Group Biomedical Systems. To learn more, visit aerospraystaining.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Prasanna N. Kumar, Professor of Pathology, PSG Institute of Medical Sciences and Research, Coimbatore. Dr. Kumar, you may now begin your presentation. Uh, good morning, everybody, but I don't know whether I should be saying good night, everybody, but uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, this is all about automated hematology staining, and you'll understand why I've put up this, uh, you know, this very catchy heading saying never the twain shall meet in a little while. Uh, just to get back to basics, uh, blood smear is a very crucial diagnostic aid, and I think we're all aware of it, even though we have automated cell counters, and we have this feeling that there's a decreased need for peripheral smears because we have a lot of automation. There could be, and we all know that, fallacies in automated reports, and we do have to have a backup of a peripheral smear, peripheral blood morphology. There's nothing like it, though I might sound a little old-fashioned. Peripheral smear morphology for hematological disorders is a very, very important diagnostic tool. In fact, I'd call it a reflex test when one does a complete blood count, and to understand, to decipher, to interpret peripheral blood morphology, we all know that it's very, very vital that we have a properly made as well as a stained peripheral smear. The various types of requests that we could get for peripheral smears could be from the physician. They could be physician-initiated requests. They could be that we have put in a point into the laboratory diagnostic uh, protocol stating that when there's an abnormality in the counts or in the flags, uh, we need to make a peripheral smear and that usually in our laboratory, it's about 15 to 20% of the blood samples are smeared and stained. It could be the pathologist's curiosity and let me tell you, tell you that happens quite often. It could be a laboratory policy, smears for all lymphadenopathies, for all splenomegalies, or it could be also a failed delta check. And as per your ISMH criteria, you need to make a peripheral smear when you have a failed delta check in certain circumstances. Uh, for example, platelets. The language of morphology is fantastic. I never fail to get impressed by even a peripheral smear, even after 30 years of seeing peripheral smears under the microscope, I feel microscopy is still very challenging. I still feel that you need a lot of skills to interpret various aspects of morphology. Just this morning, I was trying to differentiate a promonocyte from an abnormal monocyte, uh, looking at activated and atypical lymphocytes in India. At this moment in time, we're having a lot of cases of dengue and we get a lot of patients with activated lymphocytes, and sometimes they can be a nightmare because you have to differentiate them from atypical lymphocytes. Hypogranular neutrophils, more of it a little later, pseudoshediatic acid granules, gray platelets, and what have you. I tell my students constantly that every slide has a story behind it. Every cell has a story behind it. You're looking at the color, you're looking at the intensity, you're looking at the contrast, and you're translating whatever you see into a diagnosis which makes a huge bearing on clinical management and it needless to say suboptimal smears and staining really inhibit your diagnosis. I usually start my day by looking at the tree of peripheral smears and trying to make out whether there's anything different in the coloration of the smears and that means good staining. For example, you can have a newborn baby smear or a polycythemic smear which is very dark in color or you could have a smear which looks like water because the patient is terribly anemic. Or you could have a smear which has this very interesting blue background and then you think to yourself, has this patient been on heparin? Is this a post-dialysis smear? Is this a cryoglobulinemia? Is this a gammopathy? So the gross observation of the peripheral smear is equally, if not more important, uh, than the microscopic uh, you know, examination. Coming to manual staining, 
we have been doing manual staining. We cannot say that we haven't done it. We've done it for so many years. But we do know that you can get excellent man man manual staining, but there's a lot of inconsistency. It's here today, gone tomorrow. So today I have a good smear tomorrow. The buffer changes, the stain changes, the person changes, and therefore there's a certain amount of inconsistency. Sometimes primary granules or rods and dolly bodies, and of course this huge um, you know, uh, challenge which we have in the diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndromes, hypogranularity, may not be that clear with the manual staining. We do know that you need a lot of space. There's huge space constraints nowadays in most laboratories, most hospitals, and you need a lot of space to set up your manual staining. There's a high consumption of reagents, and because you're pouring reagents on the slides, there may be wastage of reagents. Obviously, because it's a manual procedure and it needs, there are so many stop gaps to it, there may be an increased turnaround time. And we have so many other problems unique to countries like ours, to the tropics, where you have stains which have to be filtered every day, because in a tropical climate, you always find there's a whole lot of debris and a whole lot of muck which gets into your staining bottles, stain, the, the bottles contain the stains. Traditionally, in peripheral smear staining, we use the Romanowski stains, that's Leishman's and Jimsa, which are what you call polychrome stains because they have two dyes. You have to be very sure that there's a fast drying of the smears before you stain. Never blow on the smears. And then after all this, you may find, because you're doing a manual staining, that you may turn out to have smears which are too pink, too eosinophilic, too acidic in color, or you may have smears which are too blue. The various reasons being because you are not controlling the procedure. I mean, you are doing the procedure. There's no controlled procedure. It's not automated. There may be an understaining. There may be an over rinsing. It may be that your water or your stain is too acidic, or it may be a very thin smear. And the reverse is also true. You may have an over stained smear. There may be under rinsing, and you may have an alkaline. Um, so-called buffer distal water, or you may have a heparinized sample. And then, as I mentioned before, a lot of stain debris can make a huge difference to your visualization of a peripheral smear. We've come a long way since those days when we were using Leishman stain and Jimsa stain with a manual procedure. And um, the ICSH reference method for the Romanovsky stain actually says, use a pure azure B, B and an eosin Y, which gives very satisfactory results. But remember, these pure stains are extremely expensive, and you can get satisfactory and consistent staining with using good quality commercial stains and an automated staining machine. This last sentence is actually not even mine. This is something which I've experienced. It has been pronounced in this book called The Practical Guide by none other than Barbara Bain, who's the, uh, you know, the icon in hematopathology. So here it is. So this is when, you know, after years of uh, you know, toggling around with manual stains, we decided to invest in the aerospray, uh, which is a very cute, neat hematology, um, you know, automated uh, stainer, which uses a buffer, which, and you can manipulate the uh, pH of the buffer anywhere between 6.8 to 7.2. More about that a little later. It uses a thiazine stain as your bead together with methylene blue as well as eosin and methanol. So these are the reagents which are provided by the company. The automation of staining obviously has many advantages. The staining procedure is programmable. It adds definitely efficiency and a more standardized protocol to your laboratory procedures. Obviously, it goes without saying that when you automate a procedure, it's fast and therefore you have reduced turnaround time. The luxury of dried slides, you get slides which are dry straight out, you know, just like a washing machine. So you get them out and you can just put them under your microscope. It really, really helps in humid places like ours where we had to wait for, you know, minutes together or, you know, at least 15 minutes to half an hour for our slides to dry. There's, there are no stain precipitates. You don't have to filter your stain. And my technicians were so happy when I told them that from now onwards, you don't have to filter your stain because that was a procedure which they used to somehow have a disdain for. There are no floats, there's no cross-contamination because the stains which are, get through the nozzle and the jets are very, very fresh. Some more, consistent buffer. 
consistent staining. There's an automated nozzle, so you don't have to play around with the buffer like we used to do when we had the manual method. Check the buffer every morning with the pH paper and see whether it was the buffer, the pH which you wanted, or toggle it with a little bit of acid and a little bit of alkali. We don't do that any longer. Consistent staining. There's an automated nozzle which is cleaned after each stain cycle. Uh, I must tell you at this juncture that this instrument has a very low maintenance. Chances of human errors, you know, when somebody says, well, I didn't put the buffer, I didn't pH the buffer, I didn't standardize it this morning. All these things are kind of deleted out of this and space constraints. It hardly occupies a space of about, say, one and a half feet by one and a half feet. So space, it's, it's a very neat kind of thing. And uh, it, your space constraints are also looked after. Experience, of course, ladies and gentlemen, he was the best teacher. We have a very high workload in our laboratory. It's close to about 400 to 500 smears per day. And you can make programs in your automatic stainers that suit you. And we have played around with a lot of programs. When it first came, you know, the guys, the, the tech, technical um, you know, staff who came with, with the machine said, oh, we have programs from this hospital and that hospital. And why don't you try those programs? And finally, we uh, you know, changed the programs to our needs the way we wanted to look at our slides. And we must be aware that, that there could be changes in the support reagents, their quality of water and methanol. There could be differences to the quality of the stain. And therefore, you could adjust your programs accordingly. Our experience with this uh, little machine is that the one uh, you know downside, I would say, but we've looked after that, we've dealt with that, is the splashing of stains on the carousal base onto the smears, and therefore there's a lot of debris. And therefore we have customized our procedure, and I make it a point to tell my techs that every morning they will come in and they will do a procedure of automatic cleaning, which anyway occurs throughout the day, plus add on a manual cleaning of the carousal and its base at least once a day with water as well as with methanol. So uh, these are the various programs we've set up. PSG stands for the institution where I'm working, and this is the peripheral smear program. So all you have to do is keep doing various combinations of fixation intensity, the ratio of the red and the blue that you require, the spin and the end rinse. And then we have a bone marrow program, which obviously uh, requires you know, far more fixation than a peripheral smear, far more intensity, and so on and so forth. So it's manipulating these programs such that you get the best kind of colors that you require. This takes a little bit of time, but once you have it set, it's set forever. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'll just take you, having said this about automated versus manual staining, let's take you through the world of morphology. This is just a bird's eye view of the laboratory in which I work. Uh, starting with newborn smears, we found that when we did a manual staining with newborn smears, you have a large amount of polychromasia, as you're very well aware. You can definitely identify the polychromatophilic cell over here, but then when you do it with an automated staining, and I just tried to put this into a yeah. When you do it with an automated staining, you find that the polychromatophilic cell definitely has a more intense color and it's more easy to recognize versus the polychromatophilic cell that you see in the manual stain. A very subtle advantage, but a very important advantage. Number two, and I've said, you know, I don't remember, I think it was Johnson or somebody who said there's water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. But anyway, you have water, water everywhere. And in manual staining, quite often you have a whole lot of water droplets on your RBC. So you may even get, you know, hold at the end of the smear, a lot of water on the slide. And this is seen with manual staining, seen in places like ours. And I keep saying that with high humidity, but you don't see that when you do an automated staining. I would like you to appreciate the clarity of every cell. This is a chronic, it's a leukocytosis for evaluation. It's a chronic myeloid leukemia. And you can actually make out, you know, the pro myelocyte versus the metamyelocyte versus the band forms or the, uh, or, or the, the, the mature forms. You can make out each and every cell so very clearly by the morphology. I think I've forgotten to know there's a blast over here. You can even make out the nucleoli with this automated staining. Or again, 
this is a peripheral smear from a 67 year old male with anemia mm -hmm. obviously a lymphocytosis for evaluation probably some lymphoproliferative disorder like chronic lymphatic leukemia and you can so very well appreciate the lymphocytes and that beautiful what we call robin egg blue uh, you know uh, coloration and the smudge cells in the background and here it is you can even appreciate a pro lymphocyte with its nucleus. The nucleus is so very clear. And remember, this is not a gym stain. We're using the tyrosine met methylene blue leucin stain. These are our bone marrows. This is the gross appearance of the bone marrow. We, uh, we, we do the, the crush technique, so you can see the bone marrow particles. And uh, I'll just take you through a walk through the bone, on a walk through the bone marrows. You all know that these are the normal granulocytic precursors. You can make out the nucleoli in the blast. You can make out the azurophilic granules in the myelocytes. The metamyelocyte, the band forms. There's a cell which is an eosinophil with orange granules. Very, very clear. A bone marrow from a 23-year-old male who came in with difficulty in breathing. It was a mediastinal mass. And you can see this aggregate of query lymphoblasts, query myeloblasts. Most probably, they are lymphoid. This turned out to be a T cell lymphoma. And very well, you can make out the cytoplasmic uh, protrusions as well as the nucleus. So there's an enhanced visibility of the nucleus with this kind of staining versus if you were to do the same thing under a manual, yes, you can make out the blebbing of the cytoplasm. You can make out that there is a in aggregated immature cells, but you're really not very clear about the nucleoli, which is so vital when you're dependent only on morphology to differentiate sometimes a lymphoblast from a myeloblast. Wonders never cease. Uh, two, two weeks ago, I got, had this little child, five-year-old, who had this sort of a morphology of the peripheral smear, very clear nuclei. The, the, uh, the nuclei of the blast were so deformed. Uh, I really thought that this looked something like a myeloid uh, leukemia, but I, the reason I said wonders never cease because it's, it's, it's that flow cytometry revealed that this was a B uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I've presented this case just for you to show, the, to show you the remarkable clarity of the morphology. This was a peripheral smear from a 13-year-old girl with epistaxis and melina, and there's no brainer for identifying what this is. And you can see that very clear, slim, uh, matchstick-like structure in the cytoplasm, which is nothing but an ore rod. A two-year-old child with anemia and hepatosplenomegaly, this turned out to be an acute metacarioblastic leukemia. Here are the blast cells and beautifully stained megakaryocyte fragments. Have a look at another smear and you can see the cytoplasmic blebbing. Though we do describe cytoplasmic blebs with so many different types of leukemias, it's supposed to be characteristic of megakaryoplastic. And this together with those uh, very well stained large megakaryocyte fragments made me have the index of suspicion that this is probably megakaryocyte and we did a CD61 and it was positive. Here it is, another megakaryocyte fragment from the same little child. <clears throat> An acute monocytic leukemia. This is probably a monoblast. You all know that we can't see a monoblast just by looking at the morphology, but I want you to just appreciate the nucleoli and I would like you to appreciate the pro monocytes. Again, I'll put it on full screen and you can see the indentation. The staining has very well brought out the indentation of the nuclei of the pro monocytes. So the combination of both pro monocytes as well as monoblasts, the percentage was something like 39% and I gave it as an acute myeloid leukemia, probably a myelomonocytic and we get to get our flow results. This is one place where I find the you know automated staining of bone marrows so very useful. One knows that when one sees a bone marrow, it's difficult to identify pro-erythroblasts. This was a case of a pure red cell aplasia. And you can see that there are no, there are only myeloid cells over here. And there's this one large cell with a pale basophilic cytoplasm with prominent nucleoli, which was a pro-erythroblast. Here again, 
the same bone marrow in which you can see a predominance. It's not just predominance, the total absence of erythroid cells. I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk, the despair of the hematopathologist, and that's the recognition of the various morphologic features which are important in the diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndromes. For example, hypogranular neutrophils. So you find that you have to differentiate these from normal neutrophils. Number one, it's a hyposegmented neutrophil, and number two, you can barely see the granules in the cytoplasm versus over here where they are much more visible. Here again, they are much more visible. So this very subtle, um, you know, uh, uh, observation has to be documented when one is thinking in terms of a myelodysplastic syndrome. In a myelodysplastic syndrome, here's a bone marrow, and this is one of my bone marrows with a dysplastic megakaryocyte, which, ladies and gentlemen, you can see so very clearly. It's a multinucleate megakaryocyte, which is one of the synchronons for diagnosis of a myelodysplastic syndrome. And a child with chronic anemia, uh, congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, and you can see beautifully the internuclear bridges in the large multinucleated erythroblast. Quite often when we get a bone marrow, we also do an imprint smear from the trophine biopsies because, you know, trophine biopsies take some time to uh, get processed, decalcified, etc. And... Uh, you know, staining uh, with these stains gives us an excellent understanding of the morphology. So here it is, again, a leukemia. Now, this is something which you people may not really have seen, or you don't see a lot of, rather, I should mention that. This was a 45-year-old male with fever. Now, this was a bone marrow which came to me some time ago when we were doing a manual staining. And you can kind of make out that there is a conglomeration, an aggregation of cells which are query epithelioid, not very clear. This was five, six years ago. And here we have a bone marrow which came recently to us, maybe about four or five months back, in which you can very, very clearly see a similar collection and you can very well notice the epithelioid nature of the cells. Here it is, beautiful. You know, this kind of coma-shaped cells and uh, here, and you know, you once you see these kind of cells, you can be absolutely sure that they're epithelioid. Another place where we use this technique is for staining of malarial parasites. Again, we uh, manual staining, you know, you have to play around a lot with your buffers. We have played around with the buffer in the automated stainer, and we have found that the detection and identification of malarial parasites is best at a pH of 7.2. <clears throat> so we've uh, got the pH. We have another program, actually. Here it is. It's known as PSGMP. That's the malarial parasite where we have a buffer of 7.2. And at 7.2, you can make out very well the parasitized cells, both in vivax as well as falciparum. They're more easily identified. So here you are. Here you have the trophozoids. You can see the eosinophilic or the acidophilic or the pink centrum here. Here you have a cell which really looks hungry. It's got multiple parasites within it, most probably from a plasmodium falciparum. And you can see very, very well or very clearly the trophozoids also with the pigment within the cytoplasm. We use the equipment for body fluids also. We send, so we don't use a site, we don't have a cytocentrifuge with the equipment. So we have a separate cytocentrifuge and then we put in the slides for staining. And recently I had a patient with a carcinoma breast who had metastasis in the cerebrospinal fluid. Here are the, um, uh, the malignant cells in the cerebrospinal fluid. And here I have finer nucleolar details for you to appreciate. Quality control, having said this about the morphology, the quality control in any laboratory of any equipment or any procedure, you all know is very important. It's an integral part of your standardization. So the quality control of automated slide stainers is as important, if not more, than any other analyzer in the laboratory. Uh, when you have a QC failure, you need to check, clean, as well as reset. Obviously, this is a very qualitative thing. There's not much of quantitation to do over here. In the process of quality control, in spite of the fact that the buffer is consistent, I ask the technicians to check the pH of the buffer every morning and to clean the carousel. I've mentioned this earlier. 
very, very methodically, both with water as well as with methanol, to make two peripheral smears from a fresh patient sample. And these smears are examined grossly as well as microscopically for the quality of the smear, which means the manual procedure with which we make the smear, as well as the quality of the stain. We have certain, I mean, I think everybody knows that the nuclear and cytoplasm have to have different stains. There's a blue chromatin, lilac colored granules in the neutrophils, you know, salmon pink uh, RBCs, coarse eosinophilic granules and violet purple platelets. So once these are satisfied, we say, yes, go ahead. And then the staining of the day begins. So quality control is very essential. I hope you don't mind if I say that I do have a wish list for the aerospray, and that's automation of the reticulocyte staining. Of course, we, we do automate reticulocyte counts. However, we are a teaching institution, so we still continue to teach our graduate medical students as well as our residents the good old reticulocyte staining, because you never know, you may not have it everywhere, the automated. So it would be really nice if the machine could take up, uh, you know, could be flexible enough to um, take up stains for reticular side staining as well as for packed stains. So ladies and gentlemen, I, by, I end by saying that the blood smear is part of a medical record. It's important, it may be sometimes the only evidence of a disease like, you know, of an MDS or a leukemia, a lymphoma or a hemolytic anemia. Um, you have to store smears. Nowadays we are storing digital images and the clinical history findings, the peripheral blood features, as well as advanced investigations of hematologic disorders make the entire kind of a package with which you can make a diagnosis on a patient. So manual versus automation, the manual staining, in addition to all the other negative aspects of it, it's a repetitive task and fallacies could occur which make interpretation difficult. Automation obviously frees the tech to concentrate on other procedures and because of this, I've managed to start so many other new procedures within the laboratory because I get uh, we have very few technicians and I get, get technician time off for those. They're programmable stainers, as I've mentioned before, they save space. In the long run, they are economical and there's a reduced turnaround time. I must confess that at the start of automation in any laboratory, I must confess that in my laboratory, at the start of all this automation, there was a concern amongst the techs whether they'd lose their jobs. And I think that goes with any sort of, a, uh, you know, automation, uh, I mean, any sort of play, any place where automation takes place. Uh, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, doubt on the management side, whether this would be more expensive, whether we would not be able to troubleshoot in the middle of the procedure, and whether we get technological support. But over the years, I think we have been able to overcome most of these concerns. Thank you very much. And this is the hospital where I work. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kumar, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what would you say are the greatest benefits of staining bone marrow samples on the aerospray stainer? Oh, if you ask me, the greatest benefit is the time that I save by using the aero stainer. If it was the traditional way of doing bone marrows, we had to keep them in methanol for half an hour, and then we had to stain them for an equal amount of time. So you know that turnaround times in hospitals these days are so very important, and we'd like to have results as fast as possible. So the aero stainer gives me a lot of economy of time, uh, you know, for especially for bone marrows, where uh, it can be terribly laborious and terribly labor intensive to be doing bone marrow stains. This takes it all over. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question here is, overall, what has been the greatest advantage for you after moving from manual staining to automated staining with the aerospray stainer in your laboratory? Many advantages. But if you ask me the greatest advantage, it's the, uh, it's the standardized stain which I receive. It's the uniformity of staining. I don't have to keep troubleshooting every time I have a problem regarding the staining because generally I get a uniform staining and it saves a lot of time therefore uh, when you have uh, you know a programmable instrument which gives you 
uh, uniform standard um, uh, material which you can try to interpret on. Okay. We have another question here. You said your lab handles around 400 slides a day. Can the aerospray stainer keep up with that big of a workload? Uh, to answer this question, frankly, no, because our aerospray strainer takes just about 12 slides at a time. And I've uh, been actually asking for another one. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's high time I moved on to having a couple more of these aerospray uh, strainers. And that's in the annual. I've been asking for it. And I suppose I'll get them uh, pretty quickly. I'm optimistic about that. But if you answer me, yes, 400 slides is a huge load. And doing them 12 at a time is kind of, you know, time consuming. Mm -hmm. But still it's faster than the manual. I'm sorry. It's still <laughs> it's faster than the manual. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we have another one here. Do your technicians in the lab help you define custom staining settings on the aerospray? And who helps decide which custom stain program is the best? It's it's a kind of a team effort. It's it's me. I mean, we we have other faculty also in the lab, and we work hand in glove with the technicians and ask them to do various customizations of the stain. For example, I was showing you the newborn stains. For example, I was showing you the malarial parasite. That came with a lot of effort because we wanted to have the optimal staining, the optimal colors for recognition of a difficult parasite like malaria. We do have fancy immunochromatographic cards, but we still keep the peripheral smear as a kind of a gold standard for looking for, for malarial parasite. So together, we keep on playing around with the programs, doing a lot of permutations and combinations, and try to get something as optimal as possible. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we have time for just one more question. You talk a lot about humidity affecting the staining. I also work in a very humid climate. What other suggestions do you have when dealing with humidity? Well, um, as I mentioned in my webinar, uh, the problems with humidity came, especially when we were doing manual staining. Mm -hmm. Number one, the fact that we had a lot of water artifacts on the smear. Number two, the smears don't dry as fast as they are supposed to when you have a humid atmosphere around you. And we've kind of got over all these things by moving our staining to, this, to the automated method. Another problem you have in humid places, for example, I don't know whether you're from a tropical country, but in humid places is the settling of dust into all your stains. So you constantly and every time, at least twice or thrice a day, have to keep filtering your stains before you use them. Now, you can completely uh, do away, not completely, you can almost do away with it by using an automated stainer because it's there, it's connected to the machine, and you don't have this problem of dust settling into your um, staining uh, bottles. However, again, a word of caution. Remember, because we are in humid climates, maybe uh, the manufacturers may tell you that you may have to clean your machine just once a day, but I'd advise you to clean it at least twice or thrice a day to get the best staining. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, the final comment is that, see, we've come a long way from doing everything manually in the laboratory to an almost total automation. I can understand if you are in a particular, I don't know how many of this audience are in a laboratory which is doing manual or partial manual. You have a lot of obstacles on the way, everything from the management saying, why are you spending so much of money, the economy of the whole thing, to uh, you know employees even thinking that they might lose their jobs because you're going into automation. But let me tell you, none of this is true because managements realize over the long, over long period of time that these kind of automations definitely bring in a lot of economy. They definitely bring in higher turnaround times, which pleases their patients and therefore gets them more revenue because you get more patients all the time in the hospital. I mean, it's just not for the stainer, but this is for every automation. So you really don't have to be worried about the threat of automation. I'd suggest that all of you just go ahead and start the automation and realize that um, it is pretty advantageous where so many parameters are concerned, starting from the turnaround time to the standardization, to the uniformity, to the fact that you can actually use your time for something better while your instrument is looking after your staining procedures.
Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Kumar, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Elite Group Biomedical Systems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you, everybody.